Como estamos mi gente? It's Melanie Moves, and you're watching Black Dignidad, where we talk about everything that's Latino, but black as ass. As you can tell from my getup today, today we're talking about revolution. When you think Latino revolutionary, we often hear of Jose Malti, Che Guevara, and Simon Bolivar. But what about the Black Latinx revolutionary? Who are the Afro-Latinx Nat Turners, Harriet Tubman's, Frederick Douglass's, Marcus Garvey's, MLK's, Malcolm X's, Angela Davis's, and Fred Hampton's? Some colonial Afro-Latino revolutionaries are Zumbi dos Palmares, Gaspar Yanga, Bencos Viejo, Malcos Sioro, Jose Antonio Maceo, and Juan Gualberto Gomez. Zumbi dos Palmares was the last king of Quilombo dos Palmares, a settlement of liberated Afro-Brazilian people who were once enslaved. He was a pioneer of the resistance to slavery in Brazil. Gaspar Yanga, named Primer Libertador de América, or First Liberator of the Americas. Gaspar Yanga led one of Mexico's first successful slave revolts and later established one of America's earliest free black settlements in Veracruz, Mexico, which became a safe haven for others escaping enslavement. Bencos Bio, he organized a slave revolt in what is now known as Cartagena, Colombia. They retreated into the forest where they formed and defended one of the longest lasting maroon settlements in the Americas, known as San Basilio de Palenque. Marco Chioro, an enslaved African in Spanish Puerto Rico who, in 1821, planned and conspired to lead a slave revolt against the sugarcane plantation owners in Bayamón. The revolt failed. He was eventually captured and likely executed, but became a legend in Puerto Rico to all enslaved and then later freed Afro-Boriguas. Jose Antonio Maceo was a Cuban general in Cuba's independence army and became a hero of the wars which ended Spanish domination over Cuba. He died fighting for the liberation of Cuba from Spain. Juan Gualberto Gomez was an Afro-Cuban leader in the Cuban War of Independence. He collaborated with Jose Malti and alongside him helped plan the uprising and unite the island's black population behind fighting not only for Cuban independence, but racial equality. All of these who can now be mentioned without Francois Dominique Toussaint Louboutin and his first lieutenant Jean Jacques Dessalines, they led the first slave rebellion in the Caribbean, leading to the independence movement against the French colony Saint Domingue, also known as Haiti. It was the first slave rebellion in the South and Central Americas to defeat a colonial power and establish an independent Black nation. More contemporary Afro-Latinx revolutionaries are Mama Tingo. Pedro Albizu Campos, Dominga Cruz Becerril, and Felipe Luciano, the latter of who was a leading member of the New York City chapter of one of the most revolutionary Latinx groups of our time, the Young Lords. Which brings us to this week's guest. After this commercial break, we'll be talking to Johanna Fernandez, a historian who has documented the history of the Young Lords. Join us on Black Dignidad. <music> Hola, hola, mi gente. It's me, Melanie Moves. We're back here on Black Tinidad, and I'm joined by the esteemed professor, Joana Fernandez. Hola, Joana, ¿cómo tú estás? Muy bien, gracias. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, of course. I always like to start all of my interviews um, allowing people to just introduce themselves and just let the audience know who you are and what you do. So I'm Dr. Johanna Fernandez, and I'm a professor of history at Baruch College of the City University of New York. I'm a historian. I write about the past. And the past is a study, the history is a study of change over time. So that's what I do. I teach college students uh, about the society in which we live. Nice, nice. All right, and let's talk about uh, some of the, the subjects that you primarily focus on as a professor of history at Baruch College, right? Okay, yes. So I teach 20th century US history and the history of social movements. I also teach a class titled From Civil Rights to Black Power. And in the fall, I'm teaching a course on policing and prisons in America from, from the early period to the present. Nice. Well, we invited you here on the show because uh, today's show we're talking about um, Afro-Latinx 
revolutionaries and Afro Latinx revolutionary movements. And, and one of the ones that inspire me to this day, hence, you know, I know. Like, <laughs> are, are the Young Lords. Um, and you uh, have a book out, right? The Young Lords and Radical History. Let's talk about your journey with the story of the Young Lords and, and how you documented the history of, of, of this civil rights group where does one start? So I learned about the Young Lords in college. And I was shocked that this history was hidden, it seems. I grew up in the Bronx. And the Young Lords occupied a hospital in the Bronx to amplify the horrific conditions of health under which Puerto Ricans and Black Americans um, received health care. And it took me going to college in Providence to learn about this group and I was angry. I was angry that this history did not form part of what I learned growing up about our people. And I was coming of age politically and beginning to question the organization of American society, wanting to understand racism, but also migration, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, I decided to apply to graduate school, and that was the subject of my doctoral dissertation. Wow. And then I've done everything because it took me uh, a lifetime to write the book. Of course, I was emotionally committed to writing a history uh, that cut the mustard academically and in terms of research, but that also was written accessibly. Mm -hmm. for everybody. And among other things, I sued the NYPD for the surveillance records of the Young Lords. And I won. Uh, and of course, it was a huge battle that ended up um, producing what are known as the Handshoe Files, the largest uh, collection of surveillance records in the country in this case of New Yorkers, uh, over a million records, including those of the police surveillance of Malcolm X. Mm. So uh, that was, that's a story in and of itself. Mm -hmm. A novela really, if, if we go deeper. So important to know that the Young Lords are the Puerto Rican counterpart of the Black Panther Party. They were self-proclaimed revolutionaries and socialists and they uh, were composed of Puerto Rican working class people, but it was a profoundly multiracial, multi-ethnic organization. Mm -hmm. So even though the majority of members were uh, Puerto Rican, there were black Americans who were members of the organization and other Latinx folks, Dominicans, Cubans, et cetera. And they focused on the community and the needs of the community. And one of the incredible things I discovered was that when they occupied Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, they came together with predominantly white doctors, nurses, workers in the hospital of color, and they drafted the first known patient bill of rights something that we take for granted today. Mm -hmm. And in New York, they also worked around the issue of childhood lead poisoning. And the Journal of Public Health in 1974 credited Young Lord milita militancy in the streets and activism with the passage of anti-lead poisoning legislation, among, it, among other victories. So I, I think it's important to think about uh, the Young Lords in the context of the period, they were part of what is known as the new left, part of the civil rights and black power movements. And what those movements accomplished uh, was that they helped change the relationship between black people and white people and people of color and white people. And they introduced the term gender into our vocabulary and gender oppression. And they made um, critiques of US foreign policy acceptable in American society. This was in the context of the Vietnam War. So these movements together changed the culture of American society in many ways, civilized American society. Uh, this was a moment when uh, 
racism became unacceptable in American society. Of course, we've come a far way from that moment, uh, but the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements are beginning uh, to make racism unacceptable. I've never had a book about the Young Lords that I could just read and reference. It was always small little articles. Um, I remember there was a, a museum um, exhibit in the Bronx in 2015 that I had visited, you know, always looking for this information to finally have almost like a textbook history right. of, of the Young Lords. Let's speak about the importance of that and some of the accolades that you're receiving now because you've taken the time and your life to dedicate to the history of the Young Lords. So I was asked to give a talk at the Bronx Museum 10 years earlier on the civil rights movement, the African-American civil rights movement, because they had the largest exhibits of photographs of the civil rights movement that had traveled from Atlanta to the Bronx. Stunning. And I gave a talk on the Southern civil rights movement. At the end of the talk, someone all the way in the back asks, were there any Latinos in the civil rights movement? And, and the, um, the director of the museum at the time uh, asked me to, to curate uh, an exhibit on the Young Lords in, um, in the Bronx. And we ended up cu curating exhibits in the Bronx at El Museo del Barrio mm -hmm. and at another center in the Lower East Side. It got an enormous amount of attention and made the New York Times list of the best in art for 2015, one in 10. Um, so that was, that was legion. And part of what I've tried to do is to amplify the story of the young lords in the public sphere uh, and to attempt to integrate the history of the young lords into the narrative of the civil rights and black power movements that we learn in school. Because the movements were not strictly black American and white, right? Mm -hmm. The majority of slaves uh, or enslaved Africans, really, we should call them enslaved Africans. The majority of enslaved Africans who survived the middle passage from Africa to the Americas went to Latin America and the Caribbean. So this notion that you get from your friends, I imagine they're black Americans, that you don't really understand the black experience. Well, you're saying that about the vast majority of the 12 million enslaved Africans who made the, um, who survived the trip because they all landed in Brazil, in the Caribbean, Caribbean, in Mexico. In the first episode that I have of Black Tinida, I mentioned that number and it's actually startling. I think only like 400,000 went to the US, what is now known as the US and 11.6 million right. <laughs> went no, to are... Latin America. Yes, yes, half a million, between a quarter and a half a million landed here in um, what became the United States. So um, if you actually go to Latin America, to places like the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Brazil, immediately when you touch ground, what you feel is a, is a black culture, right? You, you feel it, you don't have to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's a culture that's influenced um, by African languages, culture, uh, music, and history. So, so the Young Lords are this incredible group. They were self-proclaimed revolutionaries. And, and they were composed mostly of Puerto Ricans who migrated into the civil rights movement. So the first large migration of Puerto Ricans from the island to the US mainland happened immediately after World War II. And that put the young lords, or not the young lords, but Puerto Ricans in a special place um, to, to address issues of race. But they did, they did a lot more. Uh, the young lords challenged patriarchy mm -hmm. within, uh, 
within Latino culture, within Puerto Rican culture. Yeah, I and was gonna ask you about that. That was actually my next question to touch on um, Denise Oliver Velez, which was the African-American woman that you were referring to earlier and how she challenged machismo um, within the, the, the organization of the Young Lords. Yes, collectively she and other women like Iris Morales, Gloria Rodriguez, um, essentially started meeting independently of the men on Sundays. And they talked about the unequal treatment of women, but also the, the special ways in which women of color experience oppression. Mm -hmm. And part of what they identified is that women of color are usually exploited on the basis of class. They're super exploited and they're overly sexualized. Yep by our uh, society. So they theorized gender oppression among Puerto Rican and Black American uh, and other Latin American women. Um, and they presented 10 demands to the organization. One of them included, we need to be part of the formal leadership of this organization. And um, instances of uh, sexism have to be addressed in the organization formally, as we must address issues of racial prejudice. And, uh, and so that's how Denise Oliver, who was in the organization from the start, uh, that's how she became the first woman to join the, the leadership body uh, of the organization. The Young Lords dreamt of freer worlds. They, they dreamt great dreams. They believe that we should have health care. The media is involved in suggesting what we know is not true, that there is something biological about race. We know that race doesn't exist as a biological category. And when I listen to this talk about pre-existing medical conditions, I think about the young lords who called pre-existing medical conditions diseases of poverty. And so part of what they did was that they offered an analysis of racism that addressed its root causes, right? In the institution of slavery and later the rise of capitalism. Um, but they also identified the problem that a society that's organized around profit is going to create human crises over and over and over again. And so they believed in organizing society differently. They believed in a society organized around human need rather than profit. Thank you so much for coming onto the show and, and, and amplifying the history of the Young Lords. Um, I'm so excited to see what more you have for us. Um, I know you're doing a lot of other work. Uh, I think you speak about prison reform a lot on your Instagram page. Why don't you tell the audience and everyone where we can find you um, and what else we can look forward to because I think that we all need to follow professors and doctors of history such as yourself so that we can continue to uh, educate ourselves and, and elevate these voices so we can make the movements and, and all the things that we wanna see and all the dreams that have been dreamed become reality. So, you can find me at uh, jfernandez1202 on Instagram, at jfernandez1202. I'm on uh, Facebook. Probably a whole lot of people are not, but under my name, Johanna Fernandez. And I'm uh, on Twitter as jfernandez693, jfernandez693. Or you can find me at Baruch College of the City University of New York, email me uh, through uh, the History Department website. Mm -hmm. And I also host a radio show uh, in New York City. I'm the host of the morning show, A New Day on WBAI at 99.5 FM in New York. And you can hear me talking about all kinds of things happening uh, in American society and internationally. Um, from seven to eight every morning. Every morning, thank and you. And you know what? There is an enormous amount of interest in the Young Lords um, in media mm -hmm. as a, a, a project. So there have been lots of emails uh, coming about 
about doing for the Young Lords what we've seen happen in the big screen for the Black Panther Party. And given that Latinos are such a growing part of uh, American society demographically, it's, it's hugely important for that sector of American society to see themselves. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. See themselves um, in, in the movies, on television, mm-hmm. in universities, and we're already in the streets. Yeah, we've been in the streets. Yeah, I'm from the streets. all right joanna thank you so much for joining us today um this is going to be probably one of my favorite episodes so i really appreciate you coming down and giving the time and giving giving the knowledge i suggest everyone go out and purchase joanna's book the young lords a radical history and i'll see you back here on black dinidad wow that was such an amazing interview with joanna fernandez Thank you, Johanna, for joining us and dropping so many gems. You've dedicated your life to documenting the history of the Young Lords organization. Um, Some takeaways that I got from the interview that I really, really loved. I loved how she sued the NYPD for the surveillance material so she can accurately document all the things that they did for the community. Um, I loved how the Young Lords aligned themselves with one of the most vilified groups of their time, the Black Panthers, to, to create some real change in their community. Um, I love how uh, the museum exhibit in the Bronx came from people questioning if Latinos were even a part of the civil rights movement at all. The many things that the Young Lords did for their community, including the first patient bill of rights and legislation against lead poisoning. I love how she highlighted how the Young Lords were a multi-ethnic, multi-racial group who highlighted racism and gender inequality in Latinx culture while simultaneously fighting for Puerto Rican liberation from U.S. colonialism and just so much more. Check out her book, The Young Lords, A Radical History. Follow her on social media. And also make sure to follow us on Instagram at Black Finidad for more content with Joanna where we touch on her work in prison reform. I'll see you next week here on Black Finidad.